it's all about uh, uh, concurrency. So, all right. So, I'll do a quick introduction. Hi, my name's Raymond. So, nice to meet you. Hi, Raymond. I have a mission in life to train thousands and thousands of uh, Python programmers. I've uh, d done that probably about 48 weeks a year for the last six years and have uh, generated an enormous number of uh, uh, programmers. Uh, if you'd like to contact me for training or, uh, or whatnot, here's my uh, cleverly obfuscated email address, and my training company is Mutable Minds. Uh, for those of you who have access to Safari books online, I've got a series of uh, uh, videos. It's available to you for free, which is an excellent uh, uh, price. So it's about 12 hours of uh, uh, training. Uh, the only way my wife knows if I've done any good up here is if you all tweet during uh, this. And if I do anything good, go ahead and tweet to her and say, Raymond H. did something okay. And so uh, my talk is about uh, concurrency. <clears throat> and uh, I, just, I think it's an exciting topic. A topic's becoming more important to us over time. And I have a lot of advice for you on how to use concurrency and what your choices are. And uh, I just wanted to share that with you. So... That's my plan. So the uh, introduction is to, I've got a, uh, by the way, I'll publish all these slides right after this. I'll, uh, I'll give you a link. And uh, <clears throat> you can have all of this because it's got a lot of notes in it. Uh, this is for a keynote, rather detailed and uh, uh, rather te uh, technical. So essentially, this part over here is we're going to talk about our goal, why the heck we'd want uh, concurrency. And no keynote is complete without calling out uh, the Martellis and something that I uh, had learned from Alex. So uh, he's in here. Uh, and then talking about the, uh, the hated global interpreter lock, which I think is an irrelevant thing and not a thing that should be hated. Uh, then we'll have a little battle, threads versus processes. And then a little battle, thread versus uh, async. And the goal is at the uh, end of this page, you have a pretty good idea of when to use threads, when to use processes, when to use async, and the advantages and disadvantages of each. Does that sound like a worthwhile goal? <laughs> All right, achievable. And then, if you enjoy that, if you respond to it really well, I've got examples and I can go run code for you, including the incredibly dangerous live examples where I have a whole bunch of code set up on a whole bunch of screen, and nothing can possibly go wrong with a live demo. Wish me luck. All right, so I'll switch out of slide mode fairly uh, uh, quickly. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is walk through uh, uh, some examples of uh, uh, concurrency using threading, multiprocessing, and uh, async. The idea is to acquaint you with each of those, show you the rules and the best practices uh, uh, for each, which raises the question, why concurrency? Uh, by the way, at the end, we'll have a very brief question and answer uh, a session. What I'd like to do is answer all of your questions, and we're going to allocate about one minute for it. How is that possible? Concurrency. I'll have you all ask your questions at the same time, and then I'll try and answer them all at the same time. How well is that going to work? Will it saturate your CPU? Ah, OK. Not your CPU. But the server, yes. OK. So are there limits to what concurrency can do for you? In the end, you have a certain number of clock cycles to go around. And you can spend all of those clock cycles serving requests. When the request receive, exceed the number of clock cycles you've got, concurrency can't help you anymore. It doesn't provide more computing power. Concurrency is all about taking advantage of the computing power you've got. Uh, so why do concurrency? Well, it improves perceived responsiveness. I've got two people who want to ask a question. They line up nicely behind the microphone. One person asks a question, and then another person asks a uh, question. The second person feels like they have to wait on the first person, and they don't get uh, responsiveness. So if you can ask both questions at the same time, you get uh, a perceived responsiveness. Also, for improved speed. Mainly, we get additional speed uh, when you're using multiple processes. You're taking advantage of multiple cores, and that way you're actually throwing more clock cycles at the uh, uh, problem. And there are certain categories of problems that uh, uh, benefit from this. And then lastly, there's another reason to think about concurrency. I never really thought of this idea until I'd read the book, uh, The Pragmatic Co uh, Programmer. I thought of concurrency as a last resort. It's something that you do when you have to. But in The Pragmatic uh, Programmer, 
uh, it was pointed out by uh, Kent Beck, that the real world is concurrent. Things are happening right now. If I were to check the news, something's going on in the world somewhere simultaneous with now. When you're trying to get a project done, you have to coordinate with a lot of people. They're all working at the same time. The real world works this way, and we want our computer systems to model the real world as well as uh, uh, possible. And so people who live in a single process, single thread world with no async aren't modeling the real world at all. They're modeling a simplified world. Those are three good reasons for concurrency. Who wants concurrency now? Yeah. All right, fair enough. So. <clears throat> What did Uncle Alex have to teach me about uh, uh, scalability years ago? He went to work at a little company called Google that had a few computers, and apparently they had a task of serving a lot of users concurrently. And he walked away with some opinions about uh, scalability. There's three kinds of problems in the world. There's problems that you can solve with one core. Now, those problems don't sound interesting, but there are one core now is about a thousand times more powerful than it was back in the um, uh, mid to 1980s. So one core can do a heck of a lot. So this did not used to be a, uh, a very big category of things that could be done. But in fact, you can run TensorFlow on one machine and uh, train it in a short period of time to uh, read handwriting or to do some voice recognition or whatnot. And the TensorFlow demonstrations make that appear remarkably easy. Is it amazing what you can do with just one little core? Yes. But data is getting bigger, and we want to serve more customers. There's another category of uh, problem that you can serve with uh, two to eight cores. Two to eight is I've got um, multiple cores on my uh, machine, and they're hyper-threaded, so effectively I have eight. Threadripper came out recently, and so pretty Pretty soon, everybody and their brother is going to be running uh, uh, 12 cores, 16 cores, and 32 cores. So many cores are coming. And so Alex had a, a thought about this. He said, well, you can use threads, or you can use uh, our processes as long as your problem fits in here. So suppose my machine that has uh, eight cores is a limit. I have a problem that only requires seven cores with a computing power. Can I use this machine uh, for it? Can I use multiple threads and multiple processes? In fact, I can because I have enough computing power. But then Alex's thought is I am so close to the limits of my machine that if my problem just grows by 20%, all of a sudden I'm out of this range and I'm going to need more than eight cores. And so his thought is, if you have a problem in this range, you happen to be lucky for just that point in time. When your luck runs out, you're going to really wish that you had just jumped up uh, here to distributed processing and do the Google way, hundreds of thousands or millions of cores at the uh, uh, same time. By the way, do you have to work at uh, a Google in order to get access to that kind of computing firepower? No, you could go on Amazon Lambda. Uh, there are lots of tools out there that will let you, for a fee, run your uh, 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 program across 100,000 cores in uh, uh, parallel. Um, and even uh, uh, Google will sell you access to uh, that type of uh, computing power. And so what Alex had to teach me is that this is a very, very big area. There are lots and lots of great things that you can do on one core. And other problems, this is a very, very rich set. And his thought that he recommended to me at one point was mostly you don't want to work in this space because you just happen to temporarily be in this space. It's too hard for one core, but I could do it in under eight. When the problem gets a little bit harder, it will completely outclass this uh, a problem we need to scale. Uh, and so as time goes on, the second category becomes less common and less relevant. Uh, but data sets grow bigger. That said, even when you go uh, to distributed processing, what you'd like to do is take maximum advantage of whatever cores you have. You don't really want to distribute across 100,000 machines, but only use one one hundredth of uh, uh, their power. So in fact, this is still an area of interest, even if the problem is going to be bigger than that. In fact, distributed pr uh, processing is basically doing a whole lot of this on a bunch of other uh, uh, machines. Do you all agree? So category two is interesting, but you don't want to limit yourself to it. All right. In every story, there has to be a villain. Darth Vader. Boom, 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 boom. All right. Who likes the global interpreter lock? Oh, me too. 
Me too. I like the global interpreter lock quite a bit because if you're going to have to have locks, which would be better? One simple lock uh, that covers all the cases and makes all the rest of your code clear are thousands of little locks that can individually be messed up and are expensive to individually require in Malise. So uh, our friend Larry Hastings is working on a project called the Gillectomy to remove the global interpreter lock from Python. Do you think that's a difficult project? That is an incorrect hypothesis. It uh, takes about a day of work to remove the gill. He removed the gill on the first day. It was no problem taking it out. The problem then becomes all of the locks that you have to put in everywhere else in order to get Python uh, uh, to function. It turns out that's not particularly hard either, and a few days later, he had that done. So the gill is gone and replaced by uh, lots of other little locks on smaller data structures. Problem solved. Any questions? Oh, are locks expensive to acquire in release? In fact, they are. And so the good news is the gill is gone, it's free threaded, and it's uh, dozens of times slower than regular uh, uh, Python. So you actually get a payoff for the gill. And the payoff is you don't pay all of the performance cost of all of these individual lock acquires and uh, our, our releases. It's actually a really nice thing uh, uh, to have. It gets in the way of us th free threading, but we have ways of solving that problem. If you can't fully free thread one Python, why don't I run eight Pythons in parallel, each with their own threads, and then it's no problem. I'm taking advantage of all of uh, the cores. Or you can combine threading and multiprocessing. Uh, there's a number of ways to uh, go. In fact, at some point, most folks just get over that Python has a global interpreter lock, go ahead and saturate all eight cores to 100% and get full advantage of the other machine and just simply ignore the problem. There's lots of ways to ignore the global interpreter lock. It is not that big of a deal for anyone except for Larry Hastings. <laughs> Larry hates the gill. He hates it with a passion. No one in this room hates it with a passion, but he does, because none of you are like him. Larry likes to play games. And Gary, uh, Larry likes to hang out with the gaming community. And Python is not popular in the gaming community, because the gaming community is all about, I have one really powerful computer with a bunch of cores, and the more cores uh, I can throw at a problem, the more likely it is I can have clear video and get a clean headshot, or whatever is important to a, uh, uh, a, a gamer. So gamers are all about taking one system and eking out what every possible clock cycle can do. So they love threads. And Python, uh, when you do threading, doesn't uh, uh, take advantage of your multiple cores. Therefore, Python is not popular in the gaming community. And that is a section of the world closed off to us. And his thought is if he can remove the gill and keep the performance, we can recover that part of the community. So it is, a, in fact, a, uh, a noble effort and probably something uh, that deserves to be explored. In the meantime, the rest of us don't have that problem. And because we don't have that problem, it's my contention the gill is unimportant to you. Do you agree? How many of you have your work screwed up every day because the gill is in your way and you say, my God, if the gill was removed, it basically hardly ever comes up. It, oh, OK, there we go. <laughs> Another familiar face. All right, so the global uh, interpreter lock, uh, I'm not going to say is a non-issue, uh, but I would just say that it has some advantages as well as uh, disadvantages, and that uh, pulling it out has, currently has a fairly large cost to us, so we need to learn to live with it. All right. <clears throat> now, a little bit about human resources. You guys are engineers. You know nothing about human resources, do you? I know all about human resources. I dated somebody who worked in human resources. <laughs> and I learned HR type things. While I'm learning to hack a computer and bend it to my will, they're over at other conferences learning to hack you. And uh, just like I know how to uh, put a computer into an infinite loop, they know how to do that to you. In fact, one day I was having a staffing problem and I thought I'd discuss it with HR. I mean, my girlfriend. <laughs> and I said, Ellen, here's my situation. What should I do? And she pulled out a little HR infinite loop voodoo and hit me with this. 
Well, Raymond, don't you know your weakness is your strength and your strength is your weakness? I mean, eh. <laughs> That's not actionable. What do I do? Get stronger, get weaker? weaker? What do I, and, <laughs> they learn this. They're in conferences right now learning more of these. They've got a long list thing. Just pull them out and go, <laughs> and it's all over. So uh, anyway. Of course, that has nothing to do with engineering. It's a little HR speak. I should move on to threads versus process. What is the uh, strength of threads? The strength of threads that makes them so awesome is that they have shared state. And because they have shared state, it is easy for one thread to write to a piece of memory and another uh, thread to read back through it with no overhead and communication cost. Isn't that awesome? What is the weakness of threads? Shared state. Because we've got shared state, we now have race conditions. In fact, if you have a multi-threaded uh, program and you don't have a race condition, you probably didn't need threads to begin with. The whole point of having threads with shared state is to have cheap communication costs with that shared state, which means you, you need to put locks around it. So in fact, Ellen was right. Your weakness is your strength, and your strength is your weakness. That uh, the strength of threads, the shared state, makes it run really fast. The weakness of threads is it makes it uh, very, very difficult to get uh, uh, correct. So let's talk about processes. What, may, uh, what is the strength of processes? They are fully independent of each other. They have no uh, uh, shared memory. And so that makes it easy to kill one process without killing another process, which is really kind of nice. Uh, and you don't have to put locks in because they never step on each other and there's no race conditions inside them. That is a wonderful strength of processes. What is the weakness of processes? The weakness of processes is because they're independent, they don't have shared state, and because they don't have shared state, if two processes are going to talk to each other, they have to take the objects, pickle them, move them across a raw socket or some other medium of transport, and unpickle them on the other side. So they have enormous communication cost compared to uh, threads. Ellen was right. When it comes to threads and processes, your weakness is your strength, and your strength is your weakness. Who learned something new? All right. Async. Who's excited about async? No one used to be excited about async. Once in a while, a person would read a book on Twisted, and the team would use a little Twisted to speed up uh, other code in their servers. But it didn't dominate Python uh, uh, conferences. There was always a Twisted talk or two, a Twisted book or two, and a team or two that used uh, 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 Twisted. And then uh, uh, Facebook open sourced uh, Tornado, and there was a little bit more interest. And then Quido woke up one night and said, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? I know, I want to live it asynchronously. And suddenly, Quido became profoundly interested in uh, asynchronous uh, I.O. Now, what's the logical thing to do if you want to program a computer? Well, you should go out and learn a computer programming language so you could uh, uh, program it. Does that sound reasonable? And most reasonable people do that. But what if you're an unreasonable person? An unreasonable person looks around and says, there are hundreds of uh, uh, programming languages, and none of them are just right. They don't express ideas very clearly. I don't believe in them. Nobody else has done it right. That is a very unreasonable position. And in response to all these fools using other programming languages, you invent your own. Unreasonable people invent their own programming languages, and all progress depends on these unreasonable people. So what's a reasonable thing to do if you get in interested in async programming? Well, a reasonable thing to do is download Twisted or Tornado or uh, uh, one of the many, many, many uh, async packages that are out there that are well-tested, well-documented, broken in. That's a reasonable thing to do. What would an unreasonable person do? I mean, what did Quido do? <laughs> it's called Async.io. From scratch, built one from uh, uh, first uh, uh, principles. And so, uh, because he's become interested in it, it's become a key part of Python. It's now a part of Python 3.5 and 3.6, uh, async IO, and it's starting to permeate the rest of the language. We've got new keywords, async and await, to uh, support these uh, tools. Uh, and because Quido became interested in it, suddenly everybody else woke up and said, oh, this must be cool. I should do it too. Do you need async? Hmm, are you interested in async? You async. I share that interest too. And a lot of folks are interested in async, but they're not sure. What is it? What's the difference uh, between uh, uh, threads? 
So I'd like to give you a little model so that you can talk about async. This is going to be the if you know what is in the next uh, a few lines, about 200 words, if you know these 200 words, you will be the cool person at all the Silicon Valley parties. They'll say, oh, you know about threads versus async? And a whole bunch of people will gather around, here, have a drink, tell me more. <laughs> so this is what you need to become popular at Silicon Valley parties. They would say, John, tell me about uh, threads. And John would say, you know, threads switch preemptively. What this means is that the system decides for you when to uh, uh, switch task. This is great and very convenient because you don't need to add any explicit code. Your code will just be running along, and suddenly there will be a task switch, and you don't have to do it yourself. And the world is magically concurrent. Did he paint a really good picture? In fact, you basically uh, get the concurrency for free with uh, threads. You just say, say something that I was doing before, run it in a thread, and poof, now it's happening in parallel. It's actually not much more difficult than that to uh, launch threads. It's almost trivially easy uh, because it's preemptive. Preemptive means you're right in the middle of doing something, and then someone else, the thread manager, decides to switch to another thread and then come back and uh, uh, turn you on. This is great because the programmer has to do very, very little to get this on. Is there a cost to this convenience? There is. Because you can be interrupted at any time, you have to assume that a uh, switch can happen at any time. So if you are trying to arrange things nicely to where two things have to be consistent with each other, I'll update this variable and that variable that have to be equal to each other. Your problem is if you update one and get preempted, the other one might not be updated and you will leave the system in an incoherent state. In fact, that's the reason for the global interpreter lock in Python, is as you execute your Python program, global state is constantly updating which task is running, which line number are you on, uh, which opcode most recently executed. This global state is updating, and at any time, the thread could come in and uh, uh, switch uh, a task. And right in the middle of an update, you could switch, and the system would be left in an incoherent state. So what do we have to do? Anything that's important, it's called a critical section, and we have to guard it with locks or queues or some other type of synchronization tool. And the idea is if two things have to happen together, I acquire a lock which says nobody else should be running right now, do the critical section, then release the lock and let other people run. And so the challenge is in multi-threaded programs is to identify all the places where the badness can happen, where you can leave the, leave the system in an incoherent state and put locks around it. How many of you have ever used a lock before? And you've seen examples of it in books? Yeah, and you might have seen it in an operating system class at school. And the problem with almost every published example I see on how to use locks is that they are way too simple. You've got uh, one little resource, you've got one lock to acquire, one to release, and because they show you a simple example, it creates the illusion that locks are easy to use. But when you start to put them uh, in larger systems, outside of operating systems, you'll find that if you add enough locks, it becomes insanely difficult to reason about your code, to know whether it will ever deadlock, whether it will starve uh, uh, a process or whatnot. The dining philosopher's uh, problem is an example of this, uh, of the simplest example of a problem that most people have a hard time solving using uh, uh, locks. There are correct solutions to it, just most people don't get to it easily. In other words, we have learned over time that it is insanely difficult to get large multi-threaded programs correct. But at least if you do all the work, make the proofs, and think it through, it's possible to get correct. Isn't that good news? And once you've got that, you can retire, right? I made a large, correct, multi-threaded program with lots of locks. Someone else will maintain it for me, and it will be fine in perpetuity. <laughs> the problem is locks don't lock anything. They're called locks, which is a really, really, really bad name for them. What is a lock? It is essentially a flag, a signal. And if someone else checks that flag or signal and says, oh, it's locked, I'll not touch that resource. But it's only if they check. In fact, the lock doesn't lock anything at all. If you lock, uh, set up a lock for access to the printer, what all of the other threads are supposed to do is every time they want to print, they should acquire the lock. 
What if they forget to acquire the lot? Can they print anyway? In fact, that's the case. So even if you have a large multi-threaded program that's correct, it won't necessarily stay correct over uh, a time. The tiniest little adjustments to the code can cause it to become uh, incorrect in a way that's hard to see uh, during uh, uh, code reviews. So this technique is fairly uh, uh, fragile, and m most people with a lot of experience have learned to develop a natural revulsion or aversion uh, uh, to large multi-threaded programs. And that aversion is not because they don't know how to do it. They just know that it is a fairly hard task, and just when you get it right, it doesn't cause it to stay right in perpetuity. Fair enough? All right. Now, what is the limit for threads? Your limit is always how many CPU cycles do you have to begin with? But you don't get to use them all because there's a cost of task switches and a cost of the synchronization. So every time the task switch is that eats some CPU cycles, and every time you uh, uh, set, uh, acquire and release locks, that eats uh, CPU cycles. So what Larry has uh, found out is if he puts, takes out one big lock and puts in lots of small locks, the total cost of this goes up quite a, uh, quite a bit, making Python far less uh, uh, performant. Who learned something new? So multi-threading, will it give you more uh, hardware computing power than you started with? You're always worse off with threads. It always eats some of the power. So it never adds power uh, uh, to the system. And the question is, how much does it take out? And uh, we can rank the heaviness of process uh, switches versus thread switches versus lightweight threads and greenlets and whatnot. The whole reason for the existence of tools like uh, our greenlets is that uh, these task switches are fairly expensive. And so Greenlitz essentially tries to get around uh, of this by not paying the cost of uh, uh, the task switches. Is it fair to say that with you've, you're trying to maximize the total CPU power, that you're going to throw away some of that power uh, when you start to multi-thread? So should you use threading at all? The answer is yes. If you don't need 100% of that CPU power, threading is actually a pretty uh, a reasonable way to go. If, on the other hand, the cost of your threads eats up the CPU power you need, and you need to get it back, there must be a better way, asynchronous. So the difference between async and threads, roughly, is that async switches cooperatively. That means you don't get interrupted at arbitrary times. What you do is go about your work, and then when you get to a good stopping point, you go back to the async manager or event loop and say, you know what, you can let someone else run now. I've gotten everything neatened up, all, my, uh, all of my uh, state is in a consistent state, and now someone else can start working. And so to switch cooperatively, you actually have to alter your code, unlike with uh, uh, threading. You have to add an explicit uh, yield or an await to cause a, a, a task switch. So what's the benefit? Because you control when the task switch is a query, you pretty much no longer need locks or other synchronization primitives. By the way, whenever I make a uh, broad sweeping generalization, those things are always not true. In fact, sometimes in the async world, we invent the equivalent of all locks or uh, synchronization uh, uh, primitives. Uh, but by and large, a big advantage of async is a lot fewer uh, locks and uh, async privileges. Also, the cost of uh, a task switch is incredibly low. Who's ever written a Python function before? Who's ever called it? The process of calling that function is more expensive than a task switch in async. Who thinks that's kind of cool? That means async switches are cheap, 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 because essentially they're using uh, generators under the hood. Generators store all of their state, and to turn a generator back on, we just need to call that generator and say keep going, and it takes less time to do that than a function, because a function has to build up the state, build a new stack frame on every call whereas a generator already has a stack frame and picks up where it left off. Is it fair to say that out of all the techniques of switching back and forth between tasks that this is the cheapest? And not the cheapest by a little bit, it's the cheapest by far. So if you uh, need some concurrency and you're choosing between uh, th uh, threads and async, you start with something that's eating, uh, needs 100 and, let's say 75% of your CPU power. You add in threads, and it costs you 25% of that uh, power, leaving you with 50%. 
But if you uh, put uh, it in async, it eats up 1% of your P CPU power, leaving you with 74. So do you have more cycles left if you use async? So in terms of speed, async servers tend to blow uh, threaded servers out of the water. And the comparison is uh, you can run hundreds of threads, but thousands or tens of thousands of async uh, 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 tasks uh, uh, per second, which is uh, uh, amazing. So async is very, very cheap. So one of the reasons it's popular is it has low overhead. Does everyone see why folks are excited about async now? No locks, that's cool. And because you don't have locks, it's a lot easier to get your code correct. Uh, you just uh, switch whenever you've got all your ducks in a row, whenever your state is uh, uh, consistent, and you don't have to worry about arbitrary interruptions. So the coding is a lot easier, and the speed is uh, uh, faster. Isn't that awesome? How many of you love async now? Easier to get right than threads, and much, much faster and lighter weight and can handle enormous volumes. Are there any disadvantages? Well, there's a little disadvantage of you have to say yield or await every now and then to say, okay, I, you have to do the cooperation part. So you do have to add a little bit to your code, but that's not very difficult. Is there any downside? Yes. Every single thing you do has to be non-blocking. You can't just read from a file anymore. You need to uh, launch uh, uh, a task to read the file, send out that task, let it start reading, and when the data is available, then go back and visit it and pick it up. And so you can't even use fread anymore. You'll have to use an async version of uh, uh, that read. And so pretty much everything that blocks, including uh, a sleep, you can't use the regular one. In fact, you need a giant ecosystem of uh, support uh, uh, tools, and this dramatically increases the learning curve. To start up uh, uh, threads, you say thread start, and you're done. With uh, async, you need to uh, load an event loop of some sort, curio, async IO, twisted, et cetera. <clears throat> You'll need to switch all of your calls to non-blocking calls and then put in the async in a way. In other words, the learning curve on this is enormous. I can teach people techniques of threading to thread reliably in just a few hours. I can teach people in a few hours to use multiprocessing uh, correctively, correctly and get uh, all the benefits out of it. But I think it uh, uh, takes days to teach a person to be, uh, use <coughs> async uh, uh, correctly, which is not to say that you can't cut and paste an async example and have it work. But if you're going to debug it, and certainly if you're going to get into the event loop itself, you have to know a lot. Uh, and if you don't appreciate this, go look at the, the, uh, the documentation for async in 3.6, <clears throat> and then look at concurrent futures. And when you see the entire ecosystem, you'll realize, I thought I knew Python. But in fact, there's twice as much Python as you know. The other half of it is async. And async is continuing to grow. It is reaching its tentacles out through out the entire language, and anything in the, uh, in the language that doesn't fit well with async is about to get a parallel version of it that will uh, be asynchronous. There's context managers and context lib that don't play nicely with async. So we're going to get a whole new set of context uh, managers that are async aware. Uh, many, many tools in Python will get a non-async version and a async version, and it might, in the end, double the size of the language. So is it our little downside to it? There is, but there's also a nice payoff. What is my belief of what will win in the future? I think async is the future. Uh, threading is so hard to uh, uh, get right. It is so expensive. And async, as the ecosystem gets better and better, it will get easier to use. The best practices will be known. And once you learn those uh, uh, patterns, you can get up and running with it uh, 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 pretty quick. If you were at the talk last night, probably uh, Wukash uh, told you that they've had a great deal of success with it at uh, uh, Facebook. There is some on-ramping time, but once people have crossed that on-ramp, on they can do quite a bit. So here's the comparison. Async maximizes your CPU utilization. Why is it better than threads? Less overhead. Threading has the advantage of it works with existing code and tools. So if you have a lot of libraries and you have a lot of existing code, and suddenly you want to be concurrent. Which will you choose, threading or async? 
It's not intended to be a hard question, but it is an important test question, and the person being tested is me. If you don't get the right answer, it means I failed to communicate a very important point. You have a lot of existing code that you wrote and existing libraries that you want to continue to use. You want to become concurrent. What do you use, threading or async? Threading, okay? Because async, you'll have to almost completely retool every single thing that blocks. It needs to get a, uh, a non-blocking version. That said, there's some tools being written to wrap around those and run them in another process and give them kind of an uh, async-y feel, but those tools also wrap it in a way that's fairly expensive that occurs all the disadvantages of uh, uh, threading. So the problem doesn't just magically go away. So in general, for a complex system, async is profoundly easier to get right than threads, and, but threads require very little retooling. You just throw in some locks and cues and you're done. And uh, async requires an enormous ecosystem of futures, event loops, and non-blocking versions of everything. Who learned something new? If you can tell this to another person, and by the way, I'm giving you these notes. You can go read this again. If you can say this to another person, you are now qualified to make decisions on your team. Should we use async? Should we use uh, uh, threading? Should we use multiprocessing? These are the uh, core considerations. Uh, so I could just say I'm done but they're going to give me more time and they haven't kicked me off the stage. Should we go look at some code? All right. What could possibly go wrong? Nothing could go wrong because I have the code in the slides and can always fall back on a static demo. Uh, by the way, I haven't even tested the internet connection here uh, because the, I had Wi-Fi issues uh, this morning, so I'm uh, now jacked in, so maybe that part of the demo will run. So I've got two simple examples for you. One is an example of, I have a global variable, a counter. I'm going to print starting up, loop 10 times, increment the counter, print the count, print a little bar, and after I printed that uh, 10 times, I'll uh, print uh, finishing up. Let's see what that example looks like. Okay, and that would be three, six. Threading, basic. Not terribly exciting uh, output. This is an easy program that uh, uh, high school students should be able to write after their first few hours of uh, uh, Python training. You need very little Python skill to write a code like this. Print starting up, print a loop. This is a beginner problem. Easy peasy. Make a global variable, print starting up, Increment the count, print out the result of the count, finishing up. How many of you consider that to be easy beginner code? I agree. Now, slightly more advanced is some other code which says take a list of uh, websites, loop over those uh, sites, open the website, read it. Once you've read the web page, get the length of the page in bytes, print out the URL, and uh, uh, the web page. So what this does is get the sizes of the uh, home page on all of these websites, and you'll learn that the Yahoo page is enormous and that the PyPy page is uh, very, very small. Okay. I consider this to be beginner code uh, also. You still have to teach a person about packages. You know, in Python uh, 3, we have to do dot request in front of it instead of just URL lib, so the import is a little bit more annoying. Uh, in Python 3, though, it is kind of convenient. You can use the with statement, so it'll automatically close the URL and release the underlying uh, socket. I believe that this can be, the skills necessary to, be, uh, to write this can be taught to a person who knows no Python. All the skills can be taught in under an hour. How many of you agree that this is a beginner Python code and an easy thing? And it's easy to get right. Now, can you get paid lots of money to write code that, uh, this easy? Heck no, because I'll just say, I can't pay you a lot of money for this. My uh, daughter is only in fourth grade and she can write that code after only one hour Python training. You call yourself an engineer, my kid can do it. And she's still coloring and watching cartoons. Can't get paid for this uh, sort of thing. I know what you're thinking, there must be a harder way. How can we make this hard so we can get paid for it? Well, <laughs> there's three ways. You can thread it, you can multiprocess it, 
Well, in a worse way, you can thread it and multiprocess it at the same time, or you can also uh, 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 do asynchronous. So uh, let's do threading first. So the scripting style is this one. Here's the obvious output. A function style is to say, I'm an advanced programmer. I'm going to take this part and factor it out in a function. And so it would look like this. Your worker has a sole job of incrementing the counter and uh, uh, printing the count. All I did was factor out these three lines of code and put it in a function. There, very professional. The kids weren't doing that after one hour of training. I write for code with functions that are reusable. And uh, now I go to multi-thread it. Is multi-threading easy or hard? It's easy to add to existing code because you don't have to uh, a retool. All you have to do is change one little piece. Instead of saying worker, open paren, close paren, all you need to do is uh, target the worker and start a new thread. And presto, concurrency by changing only one line of code. Is uh, threading impressively easy? In fact, that's uh, the case. By the way, I'm a professional. Unlike these kids, before I ship the code, I'm going to test it. Fair enough. So I go to run it, and I'm going to test to prove that the code is uh, are correct. And in fact, it gets the answer I want. You all are thinking I'm cheating because this is in a slide, but no. I have an electronic computer here, and we will run the function version of it, single. And the function version is uh, threading single. So this is the code that uh, uh, just ran. Now it's a little tiny on the screen. I can probably make this part bigger. There we go. All right. And the uh, next version up was test multi one. Okay, and so threading multi one is the one that we just had on the slide. The part that's uh, different is this part here. And I'll go run it, just threading multi one. There, it prints starting up, the count up to 10, and finishing up. So, what I proved to you is that multi threading is easy, and that you can test and make sure your code is correct and it's ready to ship. I'm hearing sound effects like some of you don't believe me. Can you spot the race conditions? What is the race condition in this one? That's exactly it. Almost every single person I've ever taught can instantly spot this one. That uh, in between the looking up the count and the writing the count, another thread could run and have come in and updated uh, the count. So you can have two reads each uh, updating the same count and writing it out. And the consequence of this is we won't get up to 10, which raises the question, why didn't we observe that effect when we tested it? The answer is this happens so fast that uh, it is unlikely that a task switch is going to happen in between the uh, read and the write here. So this might uh, run correctly a billion times before it ever fails. But in fact, there is a bug there, and it'll be quite difficult to observe. But also, the print itself is uh, a race condition because you have the main thread trying to print finishing up before these others uh, uh, print. However, I would only see that in Python 2.7. I don't see it in Python 3.6. Does that mean that the bug is gone? The race condition is still there. The, uh, the task switching logic uh, changed in Python 3. And so whenever uh, you print, it task switches uh, right away. So it takes this bug that used to be visible and makes it invisible during testing. Nice improvement. I don't like seeing bugs. Solvable problem. We won't show them to you. <laughs> okay. So uh, in fact, it is problematic that we tested this and it appeared to run uh, correctly.
Okay, so testing cannot prove that the uh, uh, code is uh, correct. It is probably one of the most important lessons of uh, uh, multi-threading. You need proof. Uh, that said, there is a way to undo some of the effects that made it invisible. And the technique is called fuzzing. And the idea is every time I call fuzz, I'll put in a random amount of sleep. And so you put in fuzz pretty much in a lot of the places that you would be putting uh, async or yield uh, in async code, but you have to put it everywhere because with async and yield, you control when that task switch happens. For us, in threading, can the task switch happen at any time? So I'll put a fuzz between every step, looking up the old counter, uh, doing the increment, doing uh, uh, the uh, uh, print, doing the other print. I put a fuzz in between every one and a fuzz between launching the threads and finishing up. Uh, fuzzing is a technique for amplifying the problems so that they become visible. So if you are going to test, it's a perfectly reasonable way to do it. So this is threading multi two. Okay, so it's the one with the uh, fuzz on the right threading multi two, and with the fuzz, it should run a little slower. We'll see the starting up, and the count is one. Oh, are there bugs all over the place? The count is three, came in twice. Keep in mind, the code itself has not changed. All I've done is just put in arbitrary time delays. These bugs were always there. This output was always that possibility. So if someone tells you they tested their multi-threading code, does it make you feel safe? If they tell you, I tested the multi-threaded code that's being used to land your aircraft. <laughs> hmm. So it is. Everybody's excited about the Internet of Things except for me. I am not excited about the Internet of Things for this reason. The re reason is I see bugs in code all the time. And when there's a bug on the code on my machine or on some website, the consequence to me is, well, the website looks funny or my shopping cart gets uh, uh, emptied and there's something I have to go fix. The consequence is basically, basically nothing. When there's a bug in the logic for my self-driving car, it's going to be bad for the person standing in front of that car. Fair enough? So as the Internet of Things uh, gets closer to us, I would like us to develop a higher and higher aversion to multi-threaded uh, uh, code because it's so difficult to get correct. I would, uh, if someone's sending a self-driving car aimed at me, I would much rather that car have been programmed with async code than threading code. Fair enough? Just for uh, reliability. Even if you took all other reasons, performance reasons away, it is profoundly better in terms of your ability to look at the code and see it's right. Who learned something new? All right. I uh, talked to a couple people yesterday from Mozilla. Where's my Mozilla people? Where's it? Over here? All right. Tell me if you know this person. <laughs> you do. So this is a fairly famous photo uh, going around the internet. This is a fairly tall person who is at a standing desk way up there. And then just over his head, there's this little sign. <laughs> Every office needs that sign posted at about that level. Because a lot of people think they're qualified to write multi-threaded code, and they're not. Uh, are there ways to solve the uh, uh, problem? Can you write correctly? Yes, you can be more careful and use uh, atomic uh, message queues. We have one built into uh, Python, the queue module, but uh, there's lots of atomic message queues out there. Effectively, your email is an atomic message uh, queue. And so we can fix up the code and actually make it correct with the cues. I put in here some advice for you of Raymond's rules of uh, uh, coding. I won't spend a whole lot of time on them because you can read them later and I've got examples. I'll uh, say one category of uh, problems is that step A and B need to happen sequentially. What's the solution? Put them both in the same thread and then they will be sequential again. It's an easy thing. Okay. Another one is a concept of a barrier. A uh, barrier is you have several parallel threads launched and you want to make sure that they're all complete. There's a simple way to do that. You do a join on all of uh, the threads. Keep in mind, every multi-threading problem has a corollary in the real world. You have uh, five programmers, each working on a different part of your website. You can't go live until uh, uh, they're all done. So I launch five threads, programmer one, two, three, four, five, and they all start working. And then I do a join. Tell me when you're done. Now wait, now wait, now wait. 
tell me when you're done. You happen to already be done, and so you answer yes. Join, 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 and after five joins, I know that the website's done and I can go live. So go live follows five joins. It's a simple thing, and this is called a barrier. What about daemon threads? Daemon threads, what that means is it's a thread that's never supposed to finish. It's a service worker. Every time you ask it to do a task, it goes and does something for you, and it never finishes. What it does, it sits and waits. So your printer in your office typically is running a daemon thread. The printer never turns off. In fact, it just waits for somebody to send it a print job. When it finishes the print job, it doesn't turn off. It never returns. So for daemon threads, you can't do a join on them because they never finish. The printer never turns off. So what do you do? You jo do a join on the message queue rather than on the thread itself. Who designed that API? Who's standing in front of you on stage? The only person. OK, so that was me. So I, I created that one. Before that, what we used to do is uh, the only way to figure out if all the tasks were done is you put a, uh, a poison pill message in and say, I've asked you to do 10 things, and then the 11th thing is I want you to send me a notification back that you've done everything else. And so you have to have a two, -way, uh, uh, two message queues, one in and out, and a poison pill message to drop in, drop in and a poison pill uh, to get back. And now you can just use uh, join, which says wait on all of the tasks to be done. All right. Raymond rule number uh, four. Sometimes you need global variables to communicate uh, between functions. You may think global variables are uh, uh, terrible, but in fact, one of the reasons for using threading is so that you can use global uh, variables, the shared uh, state. And so uh, the solution, the, this can be a disaster for something that works in a single thread program is a disaster in a multi-threaded code. You can wrap locks around it, but there's a betting, better way. In the threading module, you can mark it as local. And that means each thread has its own copy of that global uh, variable. The decimal module does this. And so when you set a decimal context, it's only for that current thread, and it's not going to change the context for any other threads. Uh, pretty much anything that could be potentially paralyzed that has global state, you should wrap it in threading local. All right, and this one's kind of important because I don't know why people don't seem to get this, but it happens all the time, and you'll see uh, being a highly upvoted uh, uh, question on Stack Overflow, there are some mass murderers in this room. There are those of you who hate threads and want to kill them. And you're always asking me in my class, how do I kill threads? You call me up as a consultant and say, I want to kill a thread. And I said, there's no API, public API, for killing a thread because it's a bad thing to do. Now, if you really, really want to kill a thread, and I tell you that I'm not going to tell you how to do it, what are you going to do? Go look it up on Stack Overflow. At Stack Overflow, they'll show you how to do it. And the way to do it is you can uh, load the C-types module, reach into the internals of the Python C API, and just make a call, and it kills the thread dead, 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 instantly. By the way, if we wanted you to do this, would we have put a function in to do it? If Java wanted you to do it, would they have put in a function to do it? Oh, they did. Then they took it out. You know why? Because people used it. They went around mass murdering threads. So why did you ever want to kill a thread? Remember, the whole reason for using threads is that you've got shared state. And if you've got shared state, you've got race conditions. And you manage these race conditions through a lock. So when you want to modify the state, you acquire the lock, modify it, and release. What if you get killed between the acquire and the release? When you kill a thread, you have no idea whether it's got a lock or not. If it's acquired a lock and you kill it, every other thread that's ever going to wait on that lock instantly deadlocks. It's a disaster. So I keep a log of all the consulting calls I uh, get, and uh, there's a pattern. January 15th, got a uh, call from a friend at Cisco who happens to be here. Raymond, how do I kill a thread? I said, don't go killing threads. There's not an API for that. Don't do that. March 15th, I get a call. We have a problem where we're uh, getting deadlocks. I look back, oh, hmm. and I know the uh, cause. Should you be in the thread killing business? 
No. If you want threads to die, you need to plan uh, on them in advance. You need to be, have the thread periodically check a message queue or a global variable that says, I don't want you to do your thing anymore. And then the thread itself can release its own locks and exit uh, 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 gracefully. It takes some extra planning in order to do this. Uh, that said, uh, the context of that particular call, uh, they didn't have that option because this was a large th system where the threads were being written by other programmers, not experienced programmers, and if they had a bug, we wanted to kill their thread. The problem is they could deadlock the entire system. What's the solution? Don't use threads for this kind of thing. Use processes. We like processes because you can kill them. Fair enough? Who learned something new? All right, so applying all five of those rules in here, I uh, implemented an atomic message queue, leaving the fuzz in, and multi three. And you'll see the fuzz is still there. There's still the time delays, but it's going to get the correct answer. Uh, and that's just the application of the five rules to this code. I'm giving you the code, so uh, no real reason to study it now. Uh, I will show you the clean version of the code. The clean version of the code is I take the fuzzing back out, and you'll see it's not actually that complicated. What I've done is taken the counter and isolated it in its own daemon thread. There is now a counter manager. The other threads never update the counter. They just send a message to the counter, hey, I want you to update. And the atomic message queue does them one at a time. We're isolating the resource. That was Raymond rule one, or, or number two. Number uh, one was if you want things to happen consecutively, put them in the same thread. So after the increment, we send a request to uh, uh, print out the change. That guarantees these two things happen sequentially. The printer is in its own daemon thread, and we communicate with it through a message queue. It gets one print job at a time and prints it. Now, every time you want to print, you don't print directly. You send a, a message to the uh, uh, printer queue and say, print this. Just like you do with real printers in your office, you never access the printer directly. You always send in a print job, and then it atomically does the jobs one at a time. We launch the uh, workers. We wait for the workers to be done, uh, join, which was rule three. After all the workers say we're done, we say we're finishing up. By the way, do we have to do something else? Yes, because one worker has been launched other tasks. We have to wait for those to complete as well, which is also done with a join. If you do anything less than this, your code is incorrect. Did we just take an easy problem that was uh, uh, solvable in about six lines of code and make it hard? In fact, we did. So the original code was very, very small, but the uh, new correct code, even cleaned up, is much, uh, uh, much, much longer. That's the th careful threading with locks. Even without the fuzzing, it is bigger and requires more skill to do. That said, it's perfect, it's beautiful, and it's uh, much simpler with using queues. I know what you're thinking. There must be a worse way. There is another way to solve uh, uh, problems, and it's with locks. Uh, uh, to solve race condition. And people tend to reach for locks first because when you read about race conditions, the first thing someone shows you is a lock. You should never show anyone locks unless they're writing operating systems because locks are hard to use in bigger uh, systems. So let me show you the same thing using uh, 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 locks. It's um, threading. I'm going to get the uh, version without the, uh, locks. I'm going to get the clean version without the uh, uh, fuzzing. And you will see that it is still very short. There's still a couple of joins in there. But instead of message queues, we're using the with statement and doing a with printer lock to the print. That acquires the lock, does, prints atomically, and then releases the lock. All of this is done in the context of having the uh, uh, counter lock. Most people who learn about locks and attempt this problem don't indent this one under the other one, and they leave a race condition uh, in their code. And because most engineers I teach are already practicing engineers, real coders solving real problems, and they almost all make that mistake, that tells me that people don't reason correctly about locks, even for simple problems. But it does solve the problem, and I can demonstrate it over here, threading lock, it's a clean version, and it gets the uh, right answer every time. Is it possible to make correct clean code? 
in fact, uh, uh, that's the case. So given that this is possible to do with a little bit of training, how many of you uh, are like this, the lock approach? How many of you think it would be reasonable if you ran across code like this? There's still something to not like about it. It is beautiful. The with statement makes it beautiful. It's not that hard to uh, reason about once you get it correct. There's something else wrong with it. What was our whole reason for starting threads to begin with? What did we want? What's the subject of this talk? Concurrency. Here's the last of my rules. If you put enough locks into a program, eventually you throw away the concurrency and it actually executes sequentially. This program is now fully deterministic and it runs the same way every time. It actually is isomorphic to the original program, so it is slower and more complex than the original, but with none of the advantages. And so people don't find this out early on. They think a problem is going to be simple. They make it threading. They get a race condition. They start putting in locks. They've got bugs. They start putting in more. And by the time they get all the locks in, they realize, hey, we're actually slower than we started out to begin with. Am I a huge fan of locks? I am not. Thing, notes on locks. Locks don't uh, lock anything. They're just flags, and they can be ignored. Even though there's a print lock, you can print anywhere in the program. They are a low-level primitive, and they're difficult to reason about. Message queues are a lot easier to reason about. And the more locks that you acquire, the more you lose the advantages of uh, a concurrency, the more sequential uh, your program becomes. That is the world of threading. I know what you're thinking. There is a better way. And the better way is multi-processing. And so this was the script we showed before that loops over all the uh, websites. I'm actually curious if it runs right now. Whether it runs or not is uh, primarily dependent on whether the internet connection here is working. So MP single is the code I just OK. No internet, even though plugged in. Not cool. All right. I will not demonstrate the program because I am not connected to the internet. All right. Had I run this, it would take uh, about 25 seconds to loop over all of these sites, get all their sizes, and print them out. This takes forever. The pro code is correct and is not broken. That said, you will get a complaint from a user that makes it sound like it's broken. The words that they will use are this. It hangs. What does hang mean? Hang doesn't mean broken. Hang means taking a long time to do something when you want quicker uh, uh, results. I have this bug at my home all the time. I'm trying to get my son uh, ready for school. It hangs. <laughs> <laughs> Go put on your shoes. It hangs. <laughs> get your backpack. It hangs. Hangs means it takes a lot longer to respond than I expect. I, imp I improve my code by moving uh, the body out into a function. Get the site size. Good news is I've used professional programming technique, and it's reusable. Bad news, it hangs. So we ask ourselves, can some of this be parallelizable? And uh, you get the, benefit, uh, the benefits of concurrency come only for the parts that are parallelizable. And the important realization is not everything is parallelizable. Some things are intrinsically sequential. Uh, the classic example is uh, 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 baby making. It takes nine months to make one baby. You put five workers uh, on the task. It does not take five times less time. You don't put nine workers on the, time, uh, on the task and get a uh, baby in one month. So you get a point of uh, diminishing uh, returns uh, very quickly for additional workers on the uh, uh, task. So, but then there are some things that are parallelizable, like mowing a lawn. So if you get two people mowing a lawn, it takes about half the time. Not exactly half, because there's some overhead and coordination between the uh, 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 two, but you can get some improvement. Most problems are on a sliding scale between baby making and lawn mowing, and this is quantified in something called Amdahl's Law. If you want to pass your coding interviews when you go out to interview, be sure to mention Amdahl's Law anytime someone mentions concurrency. I've stated it here, but basically it says there is some portion of a task that will benefit from uh, uh, running in parallel and some point that's intrinsically uh, sequential. 
And uh, Amdahl's law has a formula that computes the two and tells you the maximum potential benefit. So in this case, I take a look at what's going on here and saying, can I parallelize it? Well, what it's doing internally is it's uh, uh, making a DNS request for the URL. Then it has to get the response. Then it acquires a socket. Then it makes a TCP connection. Then it sends an HTTP request. Then it waits for the response, gets all the packets. Then it counts all the characters on the web page. Is this sequential or parallelizable? The notes say non-parallelizable because you can't make a TCP connection until you know the IP address. You can't know the IP address until you've sent a request. You can't get the results until you've uh, seen a request, and you can't count the page characters until you've got them. That said, you can count the characters in parallel with, as you get a packet, count the characters inside. So there is a, a little bit of parallelization uh, available in here. So this task itself is, I'd say, 95% baby making and only 5% parallelizable. And so basically not worth all the work it would take to parallelize it. That said, what if you want 100 babies? Well, you can't get any quicker than uh, nine months. But with 50 workers, you can get it done in uh, 18 months. And with 100 workers, you can get it uh, uh, done in uh, nine months. So in fact, that's what we're going to do here. We actually want a dozen different babies. And so we use multi-processing, uh, our thread pool. And this will take the uh, total time down from uh, about 25 seconds to about two seconds. The speed that this runs in is now the speed of making, of, uh, making the slowest baby. It turns out the slowest website here, Ars Technica, is the uh, uh, one that takes the longest to load and it determines the uh, total running time. Your program can't finish until it gets a response. And so our speed now becomes governed by something external, which is how fast we can be sent the data. This code is still pretty simple and beautiful. It's also very easy to get right. Are you liking multiprocessing? Cool. And the one I saved for last that I'm almost out of time for, oh, I've got two things to do. One is combining, threading, and forking. Let me just say that, uh, cover this real quickly. We get bugs submitted to us all the time. I've linked to one of them if you wanted to take a look at it. And it is basically code that works like this. This was a summary of the bug report once condensed down. Someone said, I ran this and it hung. They've got a thread pool executor and they're using multi-process uh, processing. So they're using the two techniques uh, uh, together. And they say, it hangs, it deadlocks, it never finishes, Python is broken. I'll quote Uncle Tim Peters, who said this. I should actually put quotes around this. Those of you who believe that if you mix threading and forking, you are living in a state of sin and you deserve whatever happens to you. <laughs> I'm a little more gentle about it. I say, if you're going to mix uh, threading and forking, there's a general rule. Thread before you fork, not after. The problem is if you thread first, when you fork, all the threads get copied and they share the same locks. Yes? Ah, okay. Yes, I will repair it. Okay. No, thread after you fork. I read it, uh, the words are right on the page. I said it wrong. I don't need to fix the slides. Slides are correct. Thank you. Five bucks. Uh huh. And a familiar face, someone who was at the uh, workshop yesterday. How was it? How could people have possibly known that? I didn't tell people what was going to be in the workshop, just like I didn't tell them what was in the uh, keynote. People came anyway. Was it worth showing up? All right. 10 bucks now. <laughs> By the way, on the front page is my contact information if you want me to conduct training for you. And I do have free training videos for you for those of you who've got uh, Safari uh, uh, online. So they're about to boot me off a of stage, but I would like to talk briefly about this mountain of uh, a code. I've made for you an asynchronous server. I don't think that this, an example like this exists anywhere on the web. There are very, very complex event loops out there, but there's nothing that shows from core principles how you use async. The part at the top is a uh, server that I wrote from uh, a scratch. I made my own miniature version of Twisted. Let's concentrate not on that, but on the user's business logic at the bottom. The user's business logic is they have an announcement 
a function that prints, and they want this to run every 15 seconds. They also would like to run a server that uh, asynchronously receives a connection from multiple sources, and a person can switch to a title case mode or an uppercase mode, and every character they send in either gets title case or uppercase, and we want to handle multiple users. What makes this asynchronous? Well, we say async here, and everywhere we would have blocked, we use a non-blocking version of read, uh, read line, and you put in an await. And that's all there is to it. Otherwise, this code looks almost exactly like the single process, single thread version. This is fairly easy to write and fairly easy to get uh, uh, correct. Uh, so this is working code for those of you who want to experiment from first principles with writing your own async and await. And here we go. Uh, on the upper left is the code we just looked at in the little server. Notice that I've uh, set it to a non-blocking mode. And I'm using select between the uh, sessions. On the bottom left, I'll turn on the uh, uh, server. OK, and it's now waiting on localhost. And the upper right, I'll go talk to it. I'll tell net into localhost. 9600. OK, on the bottom left, how about this? On the uh, uh, bottom left, it says it received a connection. And over here, it sent out a message we're starting in the uppercase mode. I say, I love Python. And it responds in all uppercase. Meanwhile, down below, someone else does a telnet and a local host. I'm simulating multiple clients here. Not even simulating. These actually are multiple clients. It's in an uppercase mode and says, well, Ruby is nice too. Okay, and it responds to that one. Each one got their own response. But up at the top, I can send in title and it will switch to a title case mode and I'll give you a big Texas howdy. Note the uppercase H but the lowercase other letters. But a howdy at the bottom is still all upper. In other words, every user has their own individual state and this was as easy to write as single uh, thread in mode. All I had to do was switch to uh, non-blocking, put in the uh, async. Everywhere I would have uh, uh, waited a result, put in a, a wait rather than blocking. And but I can't use the regular read line. I have to use the one provided up above. Uh, the reactor or the uh, uh, the event loop essentially is an infinite loop that says, if anything came in on any socket, trigger a callback. Also, find out if in the heap of events, if there's a scheduled event, run that task. Uh, this code looks very simple. The real version of it is in, you look at the code for Tornado, looks almost exactly like this. Uh, the heart of almost every event loop has code almost identical to this. Uh, the part that is different is async I, uh, that I've been simplistic about here is not handling uh, all different types of futures and uh, uh, putting in error handling uh, callbacks. And for that, AsyncIO uses current concurrent futures. So AsyncIO is basically all of this code at the top on steroids, dozens and dozens of non-blocking things and concurrent futures. So wrap up. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, uh, to your conference. Thank you, Ray.